Hello and welcome to this special Capclave 2014 edition of Fast Forward. We're here and today we have the honor of interviewing Will McIntosh, a Hugo Award winning writer uh, who has just had a new book come out called Defender that came out in May of 2014. We're going to talk about that and all of his other work. And let's get right to it. Will, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting reading your background story. Now, you didn't start out as a writer. You've been a professor of psychology for over 20 years. 22 years, yeah. 22 years. And that's a, between the research, between the teaching, between everything else like that, that's a pretty full life. Where did the writing bug hit you? Yeah, it, uh, it hit me later in life than a lot of writers. I was 37, um, so I was well into my psychology career. And it honestly happened on a lark. I had a dream, and it was a cool science fiction dream. And I woke up and I thought, that would make a good story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to write it. And so you know, in the evenings, I sat and I, I wrote the story. Um, it got rejected you know, seven or eight mm -hmm. times because I really didn't know how to write fiction. But I had such a great time doing it that when I finished the story, I got to write another. So then I started trying to think of ideas that weren't coming from a dream. And OK, wait, I think I have an idea. And it just started snowballing. So it was really just a lark to see, you know, because I enjoyed it. Now, you are known, you were known early in your career for your short stories, your short fiction. Was that just something you felt comfortable working in as a, as a length? Yeah, since I didn't know anything about writing fiction, I thought short stories are small. There's not as much arc. There's not as much that can go wrong. And you're not going to need as much character development. So let me start with 4,000, 5,000 words. And, and so I wrote lots and lots of short stories. And then when I felt like, OK, I think I have this down, uh, to the extent you ever have it down, uh, now let me try a novel. And your first novel was actually actually generated out of one of your short stories, Soft Apocalypse, mm -hmm. which sounds like a really gentle title for a really dark little piece of work. Uh, where did you come up with the idea for this plague? Um, soft Apocalypse... I was trying to do two things. One, I was interested in the idea of if civilization collapses, I don't think it's going to collapse because of one big thing. I think what's going to happen is we're going to have climate change, and we're going to have resource depletion, and we're going to have you know, five or six different things going on. And it's going to happen slowly, if it's going to happen. So I wanted to depict that. And that's where soft apocalypse comes from. The, the, Characters don't even know they're in an apocalypse until halfway through. The other thing I wanted to do was apocalyptic books are usually about <clears throat> people who know how to survive in an apocalypse. Usually they know their guns. They know how to find food. I wanted to take some group of people who are clueless and stumbling through this, and I wanted to make the main character someone who was also looking for love. Because that's something you don't usually see in an apocalyptic novel is the remnants of your previous life aren't all going to disappear. You know, you're, you're not all of a sudden, <clears throat> you know, not going to care about all the things you cared about. You're going to mourn them. Um, and you're still going to want love. And so it's, a, it's about this guy who is looking for a woman to love as he's stepping over corpses, basically. And that's what I, I wanted to con convey was that that contrast. Well, there certainly was a contrast, and 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 I can I can you know and you can empathize with them. It's so hard to build a romantic relationship on amongst a pile of rotting flesh. Yes. Uh, you've uh, done four novels now. You you are you still writing short stories in between, or, are you, or have you just gone to the novel length as as the medium you're working in? I do some short stories. Um, I'm participating in. John Joseph Adams and Hugh Howey's Apocalypse Triptych. It's three books before the apocalypse, during the apocalypse, and after the apocalypse. 
and they've got you know, 20 authors in each of the three. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm writing a story for each of those three. Um, and once in a while, I may, I may write two or three short stories a year now. It used to be a lot more than that. So yeah, keep my hand in it a little bit, but the novel is really the central. Now, did you have to change the process about, about what you write when you went to the longer form? What was, what was the learning curve like? In, you were worried about character development. You were worried about holding it all together. What yeah. did that take? How long did it take when you started writing a novel until you actually got to the point where, OK, I know how to do this. It's, it's not easy, but I know how to make it happen. Yeah, the, all the growing pains came in Soft Apocalypse. Uh, and I wrote that one without knowing how to write a novel. Um, and the first draft was a mess. Uh, it's not a long novel, but it took me <clears throat> almost three years. I mean, I did some other stuff in between, but it was, I did a draft of it, and it was a mess. And I had my you know, readers who I trust tell me, it's a mess. And then I would go back, and I'd spend three months just tearing it apart. I'd say what the, the final novel, there's about... 40% of what was in the original draft. So a lot of it had to go or had to be completely changed. Now your second novel, Hitchers, is an interesting concept. The idea that the consciousness of one human being when their body gives out can be transferred and co -res be a co-resident with the consciousness of, an, of a living human being. <laughs> Why did that interest you as an idea? <laughs> I, it's that's a good question. I, what what interested me most about it, what I when I decided that there were going to be half a million people simultaneously possessed all in the city of Atlanta, was the idea <clears throat> that you were much more likely to be possessed by someone you knew, and that there would be that that draw, so that when someone dead is slowly taking over your body and speaking out of your mouth, even though you don't know who it is. And then slowly, by the fact that they're saying words that you don't mean to say and what they're saying, you start to realize, I'm possessed, and I'm possessed by my grandfather, who I hated. Um, that's really, I think, what I was interested in, was that, you know, that part of it, the familiar ghost or, you know, dead person possessing you. And you, you, you showed an ability to basically depict a truly hateful individual in that book, who I understand was at least in part based on your grandfather? I had to get permission from my mom and my aunt, yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. I, he's, my grandfather was, wasn't nearly as bad as, as him, but he was a tough guy. Uh, grew up in Ireland. Uh, you know, came over to New York when he was 20, worked loading, um, loading trucks at night for 40 years. Um, he was a hard man, and it was, he wasn't an evil man like, like the person, you know, the, but the circumstance, character. But certain stances made him the man he was because that's the man he had to be to live <laughs> the life he lived. <laughs> and when I asked my mom, would you be okay with me using Grandpa in this role, and he's... She said, oh, no. I, she read the book and said, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> and, wow, I don't, is that, that, that praise for your work or <laughs> <laughs> observation about her father? Okay. Uh, the last two books you've written are really absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, the, the first actually came, basically develops the uh, concepts that you put in your short story, Bridesicle, which won the Hugo Award in 2009 for short story. Uh, and again, I have to ask you, you did a beautiful job with that short story. Why did you want to go back and revisit it and mess with something that had this, this little gem that people had loved? Thanks. Um, uh, because Orbit Books asked me to. Um. Oh, well, as long <laughs> as they're asking me it was, to. The way, that, the way that worked, um, I'd written a short story called Defenders. Mm -hmm. And my agent, Seth, <clears throat> Seth Fishman, read it and said, I think this could be a novel. Um, do you mind if I, would you be willing to write it as a novel if I could get a contract? And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, absolutely. So he went to Orbit and said, would you be interested in this? And they said, yeah, 
But would he also be interested in doing a novel based on Bridesicle? And our vision for this is to expand it out by exploring love and dating in the future and use Bridesicle as the core. And I thought, that sounds really interesting. Uh, so th that, that's, it wasn't my idea, honestly. I don't think I ever would have occurred to me of all my short stories. Bridesicle is so tight and claustrophobic. The whole thing takes place from the point of view of someone who can only move her face and it can only look straight ahead, can't even move her neck. You know, that's not a novel. You know, that's a, it's a very tight, short story. Um, but yeah, when they came up with, this is what we want you to do, this is how we want you to expand it, then it got interesting to me. Well, and, and the characters are interesting. I mean, uh, you depict a world, I mean, because you, you move out beyond just the, uh, the, the, fro the, the freezer of love the, the, yeah. and, 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 go, and examine the whole world. And it's interesting because you depict a world in where people are so obsessed with making connections through the devices that they wear or use rather than person to person that in, in some ways actually the only honest individual exchanges are between these prospective suitors and the recently deceased and still preserved people that they effectively interview for the job of mate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that just, how did you develop that approach to the thing? Because it, it's very striking that that, that that really is the feeling you get from the book. Is it, is it just because of what you see around you with our increasing obsession with the screens we hold in our hands rather than looking at the person across from us? Yeah. I, when when I thought about, okay, how, how am I going to expand this out? What do I want to say about love and dating in the future? And the first thing that came to my mind was internet dating, because that's the research that I did um, as a university professor. That was the last thing I was doing, was research on internet dating. And I just thought, you know, internet dating, it's so fascinating to be you know, using technology in this way. And I have kind of an antagonistic relationship with social media and, and technology in general. I, I think... How so? Uh, I don't know that we're really benefiting as human beings by having access to this technology. I mean, having lived before any of it was available except for, I you know, telephones, um, and, and looking at the research on it, which is more negative than positive, is that it's, it is the junk food of social interaction. That the more we are using technology to interact, the more time we're spending on Facebook and texting and such, um, the less connected we are with other people. That's what I was trying to convey. You know, so you have people out in the real world and you have you know, the dating coaches who are professionals who are basically Cyrano de bergerac you know, feeding lines to people while they're on their dates mm -hmm. and telling them who, you know, this would be a good match for you based on this statistical calculation. I was, I was trying to make it a little cold. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there's kind of the contrast in a sense of the person who is literally cold. Um, but that's a face-to-face -face interaction, even if a twisted one. Now, how did you develop the additional characters? In the short story, you have one, one protagonist. And her dilemma is, is that she's, in order for her to be unfrozen, she has to attract an opposite number. And although she herself is gay, she's basically being interviewed by men because she's also beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so, her dilemma is, is if she wants to be reanimated completely, she has to basically interest a male and make promises that she herself, if she had her preferences, would not necessarily make. Mm -hmm. And while well, that's an interesting storyline and it works very well in the short story, it's not enough for a whole novel and so you have to have other characters. Why did you pick the storylines you picked to go along with it? What did they add in terms of painting a whole picture? I wanted different sorts of romantic relationships 
because again, my charge was you know, explore dating and love in the future. The first thing that I realized in doing that was that dating and love itself, maybe dating, love itself doesn't change very much. You know, that you're going to have, you know, you know, you've had love through the ages. When we read books about love, you know, written by Shakespeare centuries ago, we still get it. It's not, it's not alien. It's not ancient. It's, it's very similar to the relationships we have now. So that that's going to stay consistent even into the future. So I wanted to create a number of different types of romantic relationships and romantic tension, where you have um, you know, some people who, I don't want to say the word settling. They're not settling. But it's not the spark, the love at first sight, romantic love. You know, it's not it's, the rush of love. Exactly. It's more, uh, the realization comes gradually, and it's, <clears throat> it's more that they're comfortable with each other than you know, passionately in love. So they fit rather than spark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's the guy who um, is so taken with all of the possibilities and all the opportunities, you know, the, the dating coach, who, um, who just is bouncing from woman to woman to woman and can't ever have a truly satisfying relationship because he can always go back and look for new people who he could meet. You know, so someone who's kind of trapped on the treadmill of uh, you know, a, a shallower kind of love. A shopper. Yeah, yeah. What then, your latest book, Defenders, which, which was the one that you shopped initially, mm -hmm. has an interesting... You have three groups. You have a group of invaders, the Lyxen? Lighten. Lighten, who are telepathic. You have us. And boy, you, I'm waiting to see what you do to Virginia now that you've moved out of Georgia, because you are not <laughs> kind to Georgia. Uh, and then you have, when, when the lichens are basically almost successful in eradicating humankind, w humans develop a weapon. And that weapon is a genetic construct based on human DNA, but with traits that are certainly not human and with uh, a physicality that basically prevents the telepathic alien race from being able to read their thoughts and therefore successfully battle them. Mm -hmm. But what I found, it, and I found all of that interesting, and I thought the storyline, but what I really found interesting was your examination of what people do when they think they don't, that, that they're, left with, they're left with little or no choice in terms of the actions that they take and, and the effect that has on them while they take it and what the, after, the reverberations of those actions are later on. And, I, and so how did you come about deciding how, what would uh, motivate, put, a, put an alien race get back against the wall, and also a genetic constructed warrior against the wall. Yeah. Um, I think what it, it really comes out of is, I don't like villains. I mean, I know Hitchers has a villain, and it's, well, even he's villainous in some ways, but victimized in others. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> at least in my own writing, I get bored writing villains. So if I'm going to have, you know, I was going to have this story um, about an alien invasion and, you know, this twist. Um, the obvious thing would be the aliens come down, they invade, they are the villains, period. You know, that's it. And, you know, I thought it would be more interesting to find a way to have each of the three groups sympathetic at least to some extent. An understandable rationale. Yeah. Yeah, that like you said, their backs, your back is to the wall. You're trying to survive, and you know everyone can understand that. And then when you basically have you know three different groups, all of them with at at times with their backs against the wall, um, it's a it's a moral dilemma that was interesting to me to you know to explore it. Where I'm trying to never point my finger and say, see what I what I wanted you to see all along is they're really the bad guys. I wanted to make it that you go through the whole thing and you close the book and you think, who are, who are the bad guys? A lot of people died. A lot of horrible things were done. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that one side fully holds 
you know, the moral high ground. Yeah, the, the, the globe of righteousness and honor, yeah. Well, four novels now, four novels now. And now that you're no longer working full time as a professor of psychology, now that you are devoting yourself to your writing, what's next? Um, more novels, more short stories. Um, I've got uh, a young adult, my first young adult novel will be coming out from uh, Delacorte, which is a Penguin Random House imprint. Uh, and that was an interesting one because it started out as an adult novel and I got a quarter of the way through and emailed my agent and said, this is too, I gotta change this, this is too young adult. And he shot back and said, write it as young adult. So what's the name of the, name of the book? Burning Midnight. Burning Midnight. Well, we have that to look forward to, and we're out of time. Well, thank you so much for being with us. It's, it, it, it's fascinating watching someone grow as a writer and find their voice and, and, and captivate an audience. So thank you again very much for coming by. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest, and we hope you'll come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schad saying, take care. <laughs>